Okay. I think we're uh, good to go. Very good. Well, we'd like to welcome our audience out there, out there, uh, all one or two of you, however there may be, to the uh, first and quite experimental uh, scripture roundtable sponsored by the Interpretive Foundation. Um, we're looking forward to seeing how this goes. We know that uh, the technology sometimes is uh, problematic, or we're problematic with the technology, so we'll see how this goes. But um, what we intend to do with these is to have um, a group of, of people come together and discuss passages um, of the current gospel doctrine curriculum of uh, any given year. We hope we'll be able to do these on a regular basis. Uh, the object is to mix around, have different people come in and, and make their contributions at various times, a group of somewhere between three and six or thereabouts. And we're quite excited about the possibilities. Um, I think all of us I can say, are uh, passionate gospel doctrine teachers or have been or enjoy, anyway, discussing the scriptures. And so we're looking forward to that. And uh, someone's dog is rustling around in the background, at least for the sound of it. Um, anyway, uh, with us today, we have, uh, starting at the, the left, of my screen at least, I assume the configuration is the same on everybody's, but who knows. Uh, the tech world is a complete mystery to me and mysterious things could be happening <laughs> of all kinds. So on the left we have uh, with us Benjamin McGuire, who is um, a technologist in the field of healthcare in northern Michigan, um, where he lives with his wife and three children. And he has a special interest in the field of literary theory and its application to the Book of Mormon, another early Latter-day Saint writing. And uh, he's previously published on this and related topics with, uh, with the Maxwell Institute. And then uh, to his left, a little closer to the middle on my screen, uh, we have Brent Gardner, who earned a master's degree uh, from the State University of New York at Albany. Uh, and he's the author of the massive multi-volume um, Second Witness, it's an analytical and contextual commentary on the Book of Mormon. Also, more recently, the, uh, the Gift and Power of the Translating of the Book of Mormon, uh, both published through Greg Kofod Books. And he's contributed articles on Nahuatl studies and ancient Mesoamerica uh, in scholarly journals and has presented papers at um, both the annual fair symposium and um, at Sunstone. And then in the middle is our technical guru, um, Bryce Haymond. And uh, he's the founding editor of templestudy.com, received a BFA in industrial design from BYU, and is a professional designer, marketer, entrepreneur, and technologist. Uh, really has been the one who's helped us to put this whole interpreter together in the, to my mind, rather spectacular fa fashion that it has been put together. Of course, as I say, to me, all things technical are completely mysterious. So he could be, from my perspective, a kind of witch doctor or... <laughs> local wizard. I mean, it's all mysterious. To me. <laughs> it speaks, uh, it speaks the spells and things happen that, that are utterly mystifying to people from my particular era of the Middle Jurassic. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, next to him is, is uh, well, me. And uh, Daniel Peterson, I'm a professor of Islamic studies and Arabic. I better read this because I don't know much about myself. Um, I'm the uh, founder and editor-in-chief of uh, BYU's Middle Eastern Text Initiative. I teach Arabic and Islamic studies, um, focusing on the Quran, the life of Muhammad, and Islamic philosophical theology. And then, uh, then over on the extreme right is William Hamlin, professor of history at BYU, specializes in the ancient medieval Near East. The author of uh, lots and lots of academic articles and books, most recently, Solomon's Temple, Myth and History with David Seeley, published by Thames and Hudson in London, 2007, Warfare in the Ancient Near East to 1600 BC, which is relevant, I think, to today's discussion, subtitled Holy Warriors at the Dawn of History. That was published by Rutledge, also in London, I think, in 2006. And most recently, he's come out of the closet as a novelist with something called uh, The Book of Malchus. Well, that's a novelist's assistant. Yeah. As a novelist, a citizen. Yeah, and I have novelist. to say, I I read it, and to my shock and horror, liked it. Um, so anyway, well, here we it's are. Actually, it's actually going to be in, made into a movie soon. <laughs> I'm I'm going to be videoing my granddaughters <laughs> making a production. So, <laughs> well, very good. Uh, so this is the group. Um, 
All of the uh, people in today's discussion uh, serve on the editorial board of Interpreter, Journal of Mormon Scripture, this new venture that uh, was launched just a few short weeks ago, uh, under whose auspices this roundtable is being held. I um, thought, first of all, we'd turn to Brant Gardner, who's offered to uh, provide a sort of overview of the chapters that we're going to be discussing today, 3 Nephi 1 through 7. At least I hope so. That's what I read for tonight's discussion. That, that's what I'm planning on doing, so we'll, we'll see how far we get. I think the first thing to know about what we're doing with uh, what Mormon's writing about in 3 Nephi is that Mormon, although he has historical information that he's working with, he's making his choices of the kinds of things that he's going to pull from those sources so that he can make his history. So when we go over the overview of the chapter, what we're seeing is not just the events that happened, but the events that Mormon wanted to make sure that we understood that happened. And what you'll see as a theme from what Mormon does is that he believes that history is cyclical and that if you know the past, you know the future because history is going to repeat itself. And he will see large patterns that repeat themselves. And then in these verses, we'll also see some smaller patterns that kind of repeat. But Mormon likes to emphasize those kinds of things that parallel something else, either in a short period of time or over a very long period of time. So with that quick introduction, here we go just kind of uh, breezing through the, the chapters before we start looking at details on them. In 3rd Nephi chapter 1, we have the Nephi the second, who is the son of Helaman, giving over all of the symbols of authority and the records to his son, Nephi. And then he will leave and he's gone. One of the things that happens as far as one of these parallels is that Mormon makes a direct parallel between that Nephi leaving and not being heard of again and the same thing that happened to uh, Alma the Younger. And if you need a reference for that, take a look at Alma chapter 45 verses 18 to 19 and compare them with what he says about Nephi in 3 Nephi chapter 1 verse 3. So that's one of the small parallels that he's making. At the beginning of this, Mormon is leading up to what is the most important story for him in the Book of Mormon, which is the appearance of Christ. But before he gets to Christ coming, he has to give us the background history, and the first crisis that comes is waiting for the sign. Samuel has given them a sign. He said it would come in five years, and we're now at the point where the five years is up. Dire things are going to happen. If it doesn't occur, it hasn't occurred. Nephi goes to the uh, the father in prayer and finds out that it's going the sign is going to be given on the next day so we have a beginning where there's uh, the threat against the believers the sign comes and now everything turns around in the next chapter chapter 2 we see the reverse of that and so you build up and you get people that believe and then things start falling apart and that uh, Mormon tells us that the people began to forget the sign, and so now there's an apostasy that starts happening. We get this reversal of the expectations where now we're starting to get righteous Lamanites, but unrighteous Nephites. In chapters 3 and 4, uh, we have kind of the, the war with the Gadiantans. Chapter 3, setting up the war. Chapter 4, where the Gadiantans are defeated. And at the end of that process, in chapter 5, we again see the Nephites repenting and becoming righteous. So again, we're cycling through that process, and as tends to happen, although more rapidly at this point in the Book of Mormon, the Nephites begin to be prideful again. They get to be distinguished by ranks in 3 Nephi chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, there's a great inequality in all the land so that the church itself is being broken up. That's verse 14. And then we have the rise of secret combinations in verse 28. And everything is on its way for the Nephites to fall apart again. And that's what we find in 3 Nephi 7. The government falls, and at that point in time, the Nephite nation as an, an entity ceases to exist. And technically, there are no more Nephites. And it's a situation that Mormon saw is very parallel to what was happening in his own time and was presaging what was going to happen at the end of the Nephites. Uh, 
So what you're saying clearly, it seems to me, is that, uh, well, I sometimes hear people make an opposition. If there's literary art in, his, in a historical narrative, they'll sometimes say, for example, in connection with the Gospels, well, then it's not history. Um, but that seems to me a naive opposition. Uh, great historians often have literary aims as well as uh, historical aims. They're putting together a narrative in an artistic way, uh, however you may define artistic. And I take it that's what's going on here, too. I, I really believe it is, and I think that it's part of the genius of Mormon that he's able to not only tell the story, but to do it artistically. Uh, I think that's a talent that uh, many historians should envy. <laughs> but most don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, they may be envy it, but they don't have the capacity to do it. I, I think another thing to note in that regard is simply that um, uh, there, what we consider to be history today is not necessarily how ancient people conceived of it. Uh, and so history literature is a big division nowadays, but in fact, anciently, uh, narrative history was a literary form as well. Although, you know, its subject matter is historical and real people, as opposed to imaginary people, it's still uh, a, a narrative art in ancient societies. And that distinction would make a lot of sense sometimes to ancient people. Right, right. Any other observations on that before we start working our way through chapter by chapter? All right, I guess that's a green light. Um, let me just say something about chapter one very briefly. One of the things that struck me about uh, uh, chapter one, about the narrative there, is, um, is the delight that the apostates take in, in uh, skewering the joyous expectations of the believers. Um, it's a peculiarly human trait. I mean, I've seen it. I know it really happens. It strikes me as plausible. Uh, where it says, uh, verse uh, five of chapter one, there were some who began to say that the time was past for the words to be fulfilled, which was spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. And they began to rejoice over their brethren, saying, Behold, the time is past, and the words of Samuel are not fulfilled. Therefore your joy and your faith concerning this thing hath been vain. I mean, there's this really, you know, the Germans call it schadenfreude, that you take pleasure in the, uh, in the, the suffering or the pain of others. And it's, it's really obviously on display there in a spectacular way. And then I just noticed as I was looking at it, because I had something else marked across the, uh, across the opposite column, where when, uh, when the voice of the Lord comes to, uh, comes to Nephi, he says, Lift up your head and be of good cheer, for behold, the time is at hand, the sign will be given. He, he comes to give joy. The apostates are seeking to take away, to destroy the joy of the believers. And I thought, you know, you could draw a moral from that. Uh, and I, I suspect, suspect that maybe one is intended uh, to juxtapose the joy-giving words of the Lord and the joy-killing words. At least they hope they'll kill the joy of the unbelievers. And I've noticed recently some uh, apostates who have been doing the same type of thing related to current events. So yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly unique or uh, unusual. No, it strikes me as as very uh, plausible and even current. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that, uh, that I found kind of interesting, uh, and going back to some of Brandt's comments, uh, at the very first verse he, he gives a, a chronology, right? He talks about 600 years uh, from the time Lehi leaves Jerusalem, and then a little later he goes back to the, to the more current chronology that they're using, right? Um, yeah. 159 years, I think. And uh, so while he's talking about Samuel the Lamanite's prophecy, which is the immediate one that everybody's familiar with, he's aware of Lehi's statements uh, and the earlier material, which talks about that 600 years, and he wants to make sure everybody knows that these are the same events um, that, that he's going to be talking about. And so he's letting us know, you know, the way he mixes his histories together, he's letting us know that that uh, that he's concerned about these different histories that he has in front of him. Uh, he's combining them and merging them together uh, to weave this masterful narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that there's no reason for a Joseph Smith, a fraud, if he's inventing this story, there's no reason for him to add this type of complexity to the narrative. It just makes no sense at all if you're making up a fictional story. Yeah. 
Well, I've always wondered, actually, uh, even more fundamentally in a way, Joseph shows his capacity later on to, to uh, if you believe he's making it up, to generate the Doctrine and Covenants. Why create this whole fictional story, it's a very complex narrative, uh, in order to do, that, to do that when, at the same time, really, he starts to receive revelations. People would have been happy with just the village prophet receiving revelations. He's, uh, he's hearing from the Lord and declaring the voice of the Lord. But this is a very odd enterprise to undertake. You're just making things up to create a whole, well, not just one civilization, but at least two or three, and uh, interweave the stories and make it so complicated. It's just it's making your task harder and for no discernible purpose that I can see. Oh. Having worked uh, on a novel a little bit, uh, I can tell you it's it's a complicated thing to try to do. Yeah. And keep everything straight. I, I had to make lists and remember going back to different characters as, you know, to remember what we called this guy and that guy. I mean, it's, it's not something that just is flows from the tongue. It's complicated work. No, and in fact, quite often serious mistakes are made by novelists. You know, that's why you have continuity people on films. <laughs> They'll forget, you know, what color shirt was the guy wearing the, at the first part of this scene that we filmed yesterday? Got to make sure he's wearing the same shirt. Otherwise, it suddenly changes and with no, no explanation. Um, any other comments on Chapter 1? I know, um, Brand, you had some comments to make, I think, about, uh, about, some, about verse 14 of Chapter 1, the clarification of that verse. Yeah, that, th this is a verse where the language of the verse is complicated, and if you read through it, it uh, may not make a lot of sense. So I figured we'd at least go through this one and try to give a, uh, the listeners a context in which they can understand what's going on here. Let me read it, and then we'll talk about it. So this is 3 Nephi chapter 1, verse 14. And uh, you know, this is the Savior speaking prior to coming to the world. It said, Behold, I come unto my own to fulfill all things which I have made known unto the children of men from the foundation of the world, and to do the will uh, both of the Father and of the Son of the Father because of me, and of the Son because of my flesh, and behold, the time is at hand, and this night shall the sign be given. It, it gets kind of confusing when the Lord says, uh, you know, the Father because of me, and the Son because of my flesh. And I think the way to understand that, or at least a possible way to understand that, is that Christ in his premortal state is the Jehovah that they have been worshiping and waiting for, and when he is in the heavens, he functions as the father of heaven and earth. And therefore, he's the father because of me, because he's in the heaven, and he's in that position. He's the father while he's in the heavens. When he comes to the earth, he will be in the flesh, and therefore it's the son as the relation to heavenly father, because now he's come down and he's on the earth. So there really is a context behind which you have the Father and the Son, and they're both the Savior. Mm. That's an interesting reading of it. Yeah, that's, that's I think, very striking. Yeah, well, thank you. Any other comments about Chapter 1? Does that mean we get to move on to Chapter 2? All right, yep. I guess we do. Is there yeah, any... My permission. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, is there... Um, Anything we'd like to say about chapter two? I, I'm struck by uh, by the comment, the very first verse, that uh, people begin to forget the signs and wonders which they had heard. You know, I think it's again, it's very human. You can have a spectacular spiritual experience, and then uh, a little while later, you can barely remember it. I suppose it's one of the points of keeping journals so that you can go back and remember things you experienced. I really had the I uh, had the experience a few times when I've gone back. I, I keep journals very sporadically at best, but occasionally you read something you wrote years ago and you think, my word, I'd completely forgotten that. Not only had I forgotten about the event, but I'd forgotten what I felt when the event happened. And, but now reading it, I, I sort of remember what it felt like to be there and have this happen or have this experience. And uh, I suppose it's one of the points of reading the scriptures is to keep our memories fresh to expand our memories by, by gaining the memories of other people. Um, but um, it, it seems to be very human in the sense, too, that uh, we've probably all had, uh, had uh, friends who've gone through a divorce or something, and at a certain point someone says, you know, I never loved him. Well, you probably did, actually. You just don't remember. 
I, I never loved her. I, we never got along. There never was a time when I liked him at all. Well, you know, why do you get married? You must at some point have felt differently. You can't remember. Um, and so they forget the signs of the wonders, the great experiences they've had. And uh, going through life, those things become blurred, dim memories. Um, and then it says they began to be less and less astonished at a sign or a one from heaven. You know, it's easy to take things for granted. Uh, so again, very human. Insomuch they began to be hard in their hearts and blind in their minds and began to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. And then imagining up some vain thing in their hearts that it was wrought by men, by the power of the devil, to lead away and deceive the hearts of the people. Thus did Satan get possession, possession of the hearts of the people again, uh, insomuch that he did blind their eyes and lead them away to believe the doctrine of Christ was a foolish and vain thing. I had an experience on my mission where we tracked it out a fellow, uh, actually his wife, who... Um, who listened to our door approach, smiled oddly, and said, oh, just a minute, I'll go get my husband. And she, we were very concerned. Her reaction was odd. She brought her husband and said, say again what you just said to me. And we told them that we were there on behalf of the church. And he smiled the odd smile. They looked at each other. They invited us in. Eventually, he told a story. He had been a member of the church. Uh, I remember it being in the former Yugoslavia. And under the secret police there, he... Uh, he was serving as a counselor to a branch president who would have these experiences where he would uh, be prompted to tell people, look, the secret police are coming to arrest you, get out. And this fellow himself told me um, over and over again, the predictions were accurate. People would escape just before the secret police arrived. But he said, I left the church because I came here to Switzerland, studied medicine, learned that it's all brain chemistry and chance. And I said, seriously? I mean, I don't know anything about this story except what you told me. I, I don't know if it's true or not, but you told me the story. They see, yeah, I was just random brain events. I said, how come he was always accurate? Well, it was just good luck, chance. And my companion was a German who sat there through the whole thing. He was a convert, come out of the German merchant marine, and he said, he said, would you mind if I came back? We were just there visiting. I, I wasn't normally there in that area. Would you mind if I come back next week with a tape recorder? And the fellow said, yeah, sure. why? Why would you want to? He said, well, because I keep a file on how Satan deceives people. And he said, you are such a good example. I thought, I just can't believe he said that. But, uh, it's this kind of thing that he became so blasé about these miracles that he himself told us about. That Again, this just strikes me as humanly plausible. It's, it's really... I can see real-world application of these stories. Anyway, I've gone on too long. Anybody else want to say something about uh, Chapter 2? Well, just, just to follow up what you said, you know, I think that uh, signs and wonders have a great deal more impact on us when we're looking for them. Hmm. You know, Laman and Lemuel certainly saw a few things and it didn't affect them at all. But they weren't interested, right? They didn't start off looking for it. The righteous who were looking for it, they, they were not the ones that... Uh, that started having trouble and, and pretending that it was something else. Right, right. But all the others, you know, who were convinced at the moment, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't for them. <laughs> well, anybody else on chapter two? I look at our clock. I forgot to notice exactly when we started. I know we need to keep moving a little bit, and which means I will try not to drone on again with another. Old story from my mission. It's embarrassing. You probably, you you probably won't succeed, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, chapter three. I know we had some comments on chapter three that people wanted to make. Um, I know, Bill, you had some comments about names. Yeah, when you the study of names in the Book of Mormon is very interesting. A lot of work have, has been done on this, and there's a lot of different theory, theoretical and methodological issues associated with it. But um, when you look at names and you try to parse them, what, what names are in texts like these are frozen pieces of ancient language because, you know, the ordinary language is translated, but names don't translate. But ancient names tended to mean something. That is, they had a significance. And so, in, in a sense, what you're getting is bits and pieces of the ancient language that are preserved in fossil form within the names. And, and there's a problem when studying the Book of Mormon in that you've got several different cultural contexts. You've got an ancient Near Eastern context and a Mesoamerican context and other possible uh, situations as well. But when you look at the name like uh, uh, in this particular chapter, there's uh, chapter three, there's uh, 
Gideonhi and Gadianton and Gidgidoni. And you, you get a sense here that, you know, Joseph Smith is on a Gid uh, high here. He can't come up with any other name but Gid. But if you look a little bit deeper than that, you've got uh, some Hebrew roots. One is, is Gad, which means uh, fortune or fortunate in Hebrew. And in that context, the, the Gadiantons might be, you know, their name might be something like the, the ones who bring fortune or the fortunate ones or something like that. I mean, and, you, and it fits in with the context of what they're trying to do, which is, you know, uh, it's a money-making organization or wealth, you know, making organization. You also have another, uh, a, a part of these names have a, have a double D, like uh, Gideonhi and Gidgidoni with a G and two Ds. And that root in Hebrew means uh, a band or a troop of warriors. Gadud in Hebrew means a band of warriors. And that is, in fact, what these groups are. They're war bands, in, in a sense. So it's interesting that not only do you have Hebrew roots that might be behind these names, but they also kind of fit in terms of the you know, the context of both the Gadianton band and the, you know, search for fortune and so forth. So that's just, uh, you know, we, we can't be certain on some of these things because there's lots of questions about the, you know, the nature of the names and language. But it's interesting that, you know, you, you've got these types of reflections of possible uh, roots of uh, Hebrew meaning behind some of these names. Right. Right. Uh, any other comments before I come back to Bill? Because I know he's got something else to say about Chapter Three. Any other comments about anything in Chapter Three? We want to pick up. Okay, I'll. Uh, there's just one other issue that's kind of interesting in three um, verses eight, uh, twelve to thirteen, and twenty-two to twenty-four. You have uh, Gideonhi giving the Nephites one month to kind of prepare to surrender or something like that to him. He says, we're coming in a month. And Laconius, the leader of the Nephites, orders everybody to gather together into one place to try to improve their uh, defensive options. And, and what this means is that, you know, the message goes out and the people are able to all gather within a month before this month is up. And this is, you know, apparently the whole uh, kingdom here. And what this would indicate then is if you've got to give them a couple weeks to get out to the far reaches of the uh, domain, the kingdom, you know, get the message out, give people time to prepare, and then time for everybody to gather, which means you've really got uh, less than two weeks journey as the size of the kingdom. That is, this is not, we need three months to get out and bring everybody back in. You can do it in less than two weeks, which is probably looking at something like 200 miles maximum and realistically less than that. So this is just one of those numerous uh, factors within the Book of Mormon that demonstrate that we're talking about a limited geography. If, if we were thinking of all of North America, uh, you know, we would it would take literally months to get a message clear across the whole kingdom. So this is a small region, and this is just one example of why scholars increasingly assume that the Book of Mormon has a limited geographical uh, frame. Good, and there are, there are a lot of those little incidental clues, it seems to me, throughout the text that suggest a pretty small area. Um, well, how about chapter four? Now, let me add one slight thing okay. to that last one. As long as we're talking about a limited area, if we believe that that limited area might have been in Mesoamerica, it is at least interesting, although it doesn't prove anything, but at least interesting uh, that the Aztecs would also give notice that we are coming. So they would go to a people and they would say, uh, you know, it, it's time. If you haven't submitted by now, you've got X amount of time to get ready and we're on our way. So mm -hmm. that is a process that is at least known in that part of the world. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So it fits the area, the, the area that many of us presume it to be in. Um, well, chapter four, um, chapter four has always interested me because uh, I've written a fair amount on the Gadianton robbers on guerrilla warfare. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by guerrilla warfare, and the Gadianton robbers have always been my very favorite group in the Book of Mormon. I was very fond of them. Um, and, and here you have a case where they violate the principles of guerrilla warfare, um, where they're about to. The Nephites... Um, get tired of the raids from the Gadiantans who are up in the mountains. It's been really hard to go after them because they're in this difficult terrain. Um, 
and they are coming down out of the mountains to attack the Nephites and the Lamanites. The, so the people in the settled lands gather their stuff together, fortify their cities, and uh, and sort of abandon the countryside to the Gadiantans. Um, but this creates problems for the Gadiantans, as described in these chapters. Um, they come down out of the mountains. They um, they begin to take possession of all the lands, it says in verse 1 of chapter 4, uh, which had been deserted by the Nephites, and the cities which had been left desolate, seemingly a victory, right? But there were no wild beasts nor game in those lands. There's nothing for them to eat. The robbers couldn't exist uh, for the want of food. They're out in the wilderness. They don't know what to do. Um, there's no chance for the robbers to plunder and obtain food, which is what they normally do. And so they find themselves forced, in verse 5, to go up to battle against the Nephites. And what's interesting here is it seems to me that the, the, uh, the Nephites and the Gadianton robbers have basically switched roles. Now it's the Nephites who are in these inaccessible places. In effect, uh, the artificial mountains, if you will fortified cities, and they've got all the good stuff, the food and everything inside, and the Gadiantans are forced to come against them. The, um, the advantage that a guerrilla warrior has, typically, is that the guerrilla warrior can fight at times and places of his choosing. Um, when he's forced to defend certain territory or forced to attack a fortified area um, and has very little decision or freedom of decision about it, then he loses that advantage of being able to hit and run, hit and run, uh, maximize uh, casualties of the enemy and minimize his own. And so they've, they've, uh, they've set themselves up. The alternative was to spread themselves out upon the land. They can't do that because the Nephites could come out, make sorties out of, in effect, their fortified, you know, mountains, their cities, uh, and could go after the Gadiantans. So eventually they're forced to do battle, um, and they lose. They lose because they've engaged in what Mao Zedong called a premature regularization. They've had to start behaving as a regular army uh, before they were really ready to do it. Um, and so that, to me, is is a very striking illustration of something that you know, I really don't think Joseph Smith had been reading Vo Nguyen Gyap or, or Che Guevara or you know Mao Zedong's treatises on guerrilla warfare. But uh, But what goes on in these chapters illustrates the principles in those books. Uh, by those great communist guerrilla warfare theorists extremely well uh, before the books were even written, before the principles had been deduced or decocted from, uh, from real life. So that has always been very striking to me. The Joseph Smith that we know from history is the guy who likes to get on his black horse Charlie, dress up in a uniform, parade in front of the Nauvoo Legion. It's all fifes and drums and you know, sort of early 19th century American romanticism about the military. But that's not what these chapters are like. These are not coming, in my view, they're not coming from Joseph Smith's mind. Uh, they're coming from reality. Mm. So, um, end of that discourse. Um, Bill, I think you had some other things to say about the Holy Ones in Chapter 4. Right, it's interesting that uh, in Chapter uh, 414 it says, It hath become expedient that I, that is Mormon here, according to the will of God, that the prayers of those, these are the ancestors, those who have gone hence, who were hol the holy ones, should be fulfilled according to their faith. This is a, a prophecy that, you know, or a statement that these ancient people prayed that certain things would occur and it's they're going to be fulfilled because they were holy ones and their faith, uh, will, you know, will be uh, sustained. The holy ones here in, is a technical term in, in the Hebrew Bible. It's uh, kadoshim, which is translated as... Um, into Greek as hagios and into English generally as saints. But the holy ones here are, um, in the Hebrew Bible, are part of the divine council. That is, these are the, the ones that surround God. He's surrounded by the holy ones, and the Lord is the holy one of Israel. And, and these are the sons of God, or the divine council, and in a sense what he's saying here is that the dead ancestors, the righteous ancestors, are now holy ones. They're, that is, they're part of this divine council. They're 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 in the presence of God and and are uh, interacting with God, interceding in a sense on behalf of the um, you know the people with their prayers and whatnot. And and it just kind of is an interesting aspect of the the way the um, the Book of Mormon reflects this kind of ancient concept. There. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, any other comments about Chapter Four from anyone else before I return to Bill? 
I know he's got one other comment mm -hmm. to make about the execution of Zemnariah. Well, yeah, this is just a quick one. It's interesting that Zemnariah is hanged on a tree, which in one sense kind of seems like, you know, cowboy vigilante justice of hanging a guy on a tree, which is actually, you know, happened in the Old West. I don't know if Joseph Smith was living in the Old West, but uh, but it also reflects, I think, much better the ancient uh, practice of uh, Deuteronomy 21:22, which says that if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, he, sh he and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall remain all night upon the tree, and thou shalt not anywise bury bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. That is, this is an ancient Hebrew practice as well. But not only that, but that they are that hanging on a tree is a, is a form of cursing the dead person. And beyond that, in rabbinic literature, this is not in the, in the Deuteronomy, this is not in the Bible, but in rabbinic interpretations of the Bible, they say also you need to chop down the tree after, it, after the man is hanged on it because the tree kind of gets cursed as well. And so what you see is the Book of Mormon, they do exactly this. They hang the guy and then chop down the tree, which is not Old West practice, but it is ancient Jewish practice that, that the hanging on the tree is cursing and the tree must be chopped down after they're hung. So you've got another little reflection of some of these uh, kind of incidental characteristics of ancient societies in that regard. Yeah. So Rabbi Joseph Smith was reflecting his reading in, uh, in the Talmud, I suppose? I think he picked that up during the Cambridge years, right? Right. Yeah. Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah. The, the lost years of Joseph revealed. Um, Good. Anything else about chapter four? Or move on to chapter, what comes next? Five. Nothing? All right. Um, well, I've got a note here that says Brant wants to talk about Mormon's belated introduction. Do you? I, I really do, because when I was reading this oh, a few years back, it struck me as entirely unusual. Um, let, let me give you verse 12 in chapter five. And behold, I am called Mormon, being called after the land of Mormon, the land which is Alma did establish the church among the people, yea, the first church which was established among them. And then he goes on to say, behold, I'm a disciple. What's really interesting is Mormon has been talking to us and interjecting himself as an editor since the beginning in Mosiah, when we begin to have text from him. So we start in Mosiah, he keeps saying, I, and he simply assumes that we know who he is. And then finally in Third Nephi, he gets around to saying, oh yeah, by the way, my name is Mormon. And it seems really odd that after all of this time, he should come out and say, I am Mormon. Uh, and the answer that I would have to it is absolutely speculative because he doesn't tell us. But I think there's two things that we can guess from what he said. Uh, the first one is he probably should have introduced himself at the beginning of his book, at the beginning of Lehi, where he should have said, by the way, I'm Mormon, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. He seems to do that. We're missing it for 116 pages. However, he comes to this point, and again he says, I'm Mormon. Why does he do it here? He does it here, I think, because of what he begins to tell us in verse 13. He says in verse 13, Behold, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I have been called of him to declare his word among his people that they might have everlasting life. We may have known Mormon as the editor and as the historian up to this point, but at this point, this crucial point where he's beginning to introduce who the Savior is and describe his God come to earth, he is declaring that he is an apostle, that he is one who has the authority to make that declaration. So this is not his introduction of Mormon the writer. This is his introduction of Mormon the witness to Christ. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other comments about that chapter? I have something I'd like to stick in, if I may. Um, no mission stories. No mission stories. Um, well, you know, my life really ended with my mission. I haven't had experiences since. Um, I was struck by the by the fact that you have these uh, these Gadian robbers who were taken prisoner, um, and people come in, Nephites come in and preach to them, and those who accept the preaching uh, enter into a covenant that they'll murder no more, set at liberty. 
Uh, but as many, it says in verse 5 of chapter 5, as many as there were who did not enter into a covenant, who did still continue to have those secret murders in their hearts, as many as were found breathing out threatenings against their brethren, were condemned and punished according to the law. I presume they were executed. Um, and so it strikes me, it has always struck me, there's something much more going on with the, uh, with the Gadianton robbers than just a bunch of robbers. Uh, the, the term robber is used partly to marginalize them and, uh, and make them less attractive. They actually do stand for something. We'll see that a little bit later in this passage if I don't drone on too long and we get to it before we close. There was one other thing that I wanted to, uh, I mean, the fact is they're willing to die for whatever, whatever it is that they do. Um, uh, there was one, th one thing that I wanted to bring up in connection with the hanging of Zemariah very briefly. In chapter 4, I forgot to mention it. When he's hanged, they hang him till he's dead, they fell the tree to the earth, and then they did cry with a loud voice, saying, May the Lord preserve his people in righteousness and in holiness of heart. They may cause to be felled to the earth all who shall seek to slay them because of power and secret combinations, even as this man hath been felled to the earth. And it strikes me as very similar to the kinds of things you get in simile oaths. Uh, for example, with, uh, with Moroni and his title of liberty, uh, when the people come and run, you know, and cast their garments at his feet and say, may we be trampled upon, even as we trample upon these garments if we don't obey. They use physical objects uh, as a way of making a point. You know, smash the idol in ancient, uh, in ancient contexts and say, may we be smashed even as this idol is smashed if we don't obey your commands, that sort of thing. So here, too, um, um, you have a kind of simile being made with, with the death of Zemnariah. Anything else about chapter 5? We are actually running short on the time we allotted to ourselves, so let's go on to chapter 6. Uh, anything, there, anything there that we'd like to talk about in particular? Bill looks like he's going silent. Um, I've said enough. I know when to shut up, Dan. <laughs> um, well, you have a description here of people beginning to be distinguished by ranks and so on, uh, the rise of of judges and secret orders who put the prophets to death. It says in verse 18, they did not sin ignorantly, for they knew the will of God concerning them, for it had been taught unto them, wherefore they did willfully rebel against God. And it, it strikes me that uh, the term apostasy, um, we often use as a synonym for that, the, the phrase falling away. But apostasy really means rebellion. It's a, it's a coup. Um, it's to stand against something, to stand up against something is what the Greek means. And uh, so this is a case of apostasy in that strongest possible sense. They're not just drifting away from truth. They're rebelling against their covenants, rebelling against the things they've been taught. Uh, any, anybody else? In, in the theme of Mormon creating repetitions, if I remember correctly, Abinadi also spoke of willful rebellion. And I doubt that uh, Nephi had read exactly what Abinadi said, but I know that Mormon did, and uh, I suspect that he made sure that he paralleled those two experiences. Yeah. Anybody on chapter 6? Okay. Uh, well, on to chapter 7. What happens in chapter 7? Pretty bad news. The whole thing falls apart. And when I was in high school, we read uh, the novel um, Lord of the Flies. I don't know if anybody else read that. It's you take these little kids and leave them on an island. Pretty soon, it's state of nature. You know, um, what is it Hobbes said about a state of nature? That life in it was solitary, poor, nasty, brutal, brutish, and short, or something like that. You know, where everything just falls apart. The institutions collapse. And... Um, and as the government collapses, people go back to the most elemental organization in society, which is family and extended family, clans, tribes, and their families. And it's a war of not every man against every man, but of every tribe, every clan, every ethnic faction against every other. Um, so that they have, uh, the Gadians have not managed to establish a kingdom, a monarchy. Well, in part of the country they have. Basically, they've managed to destroy and not create. Um, and... Um, and so it's, it's a sad end to this section of Nephite history. Any other comments about that? Well, it's just kind of interesting to see uh, 
attempts at nation building in place like your Afghanistan where um, you know very rapidly you can see the institutions I mean they haven't failed yet but they're kind of in that moving in that direction but it, you know institutions like that can collapse very rapidly and Afghanistan you know fluctuates between tribal groups that are feuding with each other and then super tribal groups like uh, Taliban or Al Qaeda or whatever who are also involved in the feud and then a central government is trying to maintain control and yet there's uh, kind of anarchy you so you can you know see real life situations where precisely this type of thing occurs as the result of destabilization of governments and uh, collapse of central authority and and moral uh, collapse and so forth I mean it's you know it happens right before our eyes if we uh, pay attention to it and it's reflected very nicely I think in, in what's described in the Book of Mormon you saw it in Somalia you still see it in Somalia you saw it in the Balkans um, where people who lived next to one another for years and years and years generations um, revert to ethnic and religious groups and uh, start killing one another, ethnic cleansing. Um, so, you know, there was, if, if we're, uh, I don't know if there are any more comments people want to make about Chapter 7, I realize I just ran past something I wanted to say about Chapter 3. So if anybody's trying to follow this in an orderly way, I'm doing my best to gum that up. Because um, there was a passage I did want to comment on um, in Chapter 3 where you have this remarkable letter from... Uh, from uh, uh, Gideonhi to um, Laconius, the governor of the land. And it lays out what has to be seen as kind of Gadiant ideology. And again, if you try to see them as simply robbers, it doesn't account for what goes on in the book. And there are various points in the Book of Mormon where the Gadiantans will invite everybody to join them, become acquainted with our secret works, all this sort of thing. Well, you know, if you're a robber, you don't want everybody to join your gang. You've got to have people to steal from. Uh, there's no point. You've got to have sheep to shear, you know? Um, and so it, it's always seemed to me there's something more going on with the Gadiant robbers than just robbers. That's the Book of Mormon's derisive term for them, and, and, and we're told at various points, Book of Mormon writers say, we're not going to tell you everything about them. Why? Because it's seductive, apparently. Well, here he is um, giving some of their ideology that he's leading his, uh, his warriors against the Nephites. He says, because I know of their everlasting hatred towards you. This is chapter 3, verse 4. Because of the many wrongs which he had done unto them. There's, a, there's an ideology based on a sense of a wrongness, having been wronged, of usurpation, and so, so on. Therefore I've written this epistle, sealing it with mine own hand, feeling for your welfare, because of your firmness in that which he believed to be right, your noble spirit in the field of battle. But he says, in verse 7, yield yourselves up to us, unite with us, become acquainted with our secret works, Become our brethren, that you may be like unto us, not our slaves, but our brethren, partners of all of our substance. Then he talks about how the works of the Gadiant robbers are good. He says, I know them to be good. They're of ancient date. They've been handed down to us. And all he wants to do is, is recover the rights of this people who descended against you because of your wickedness, descended away from you. Um, and it's astonishing to, uh, to Laconius when he gets it, you know, hearing about the wrongs of people who had received no wrong, it says. But the point is, I think, there's an ideology going on here. They have their own books that are sealed up. Um, they have their own accounts, their covenants, their tradition that have been passed down. The Gadiant robbers, to me, are plainly an alternative religious vision of society. They're not just robbers. There's something else much deeper going on here. They want everybody to join up. They're, they want to convert people to their point of view. This is not simply the mafia or you know the Crips and the Bloods or something like that. They want everybody to join up. So um, it's you know, the Gadiantans is something much more interesting than the Book of Mormon wants us to think they are. You can see this reflected in, in historical other historical societies as well, like the Mongol conquests which became, began as the Mongols, as an ethnic group and tribe, but in fact rapidly turned into accepting as allies, and they even had a ritual of accepting a noker as a uh, blood brother, where you're initiated into brotherhood in the tribe through a special ritual, um, to, to bring in anybody. And there were Chinese and Persians and Turks and T Tibetans. Everybody was part of this Mongol confederation. And, and and so this type of phenomenon is is again quite plausible historically. It's it it fits the real world, and there are 
lots of real world, world examples of that type of thing. Yeah. And, and along with this too, I think we um, we have this persistent notion of wanting to make a king, right? Correct. The king men. I mean, in other historical settings, we see these these struggles um, because we want to be just like the neighbors, right? Or we want to we want to have a government that we see other other groups have, um, and and see it in, in have it encourage us the same way we we believe it helps them, but uh, but. But whatever this group is, they they maintain this desire to have a king um, through this whole historical period. Yeah, it's always there. The recurrent temptation to monarchy. Um, I suppose you see it in People magazine, an American fascination with the British royal family. Um, <laughs> Although in the Book of Mormon, it isn't just a political system. Uh, in the ancient world, politics, religion... Um, everything is all wrapped up into the same ball. Right. When they're looking for a king, it's also being accompanied with hierarchical society, uh, typically with uh, costly apparel, people thinking that they're better than someone else. And so there's an entire social structure that they're wanting in addition to the king, and the king sort of stands for this larger social uh, organization that is really antithetical to what the Nephites have been preaching. Right. Well, and I think, you know, this, this assassination of the judges and the corruption of the judges is, is more than just attempting to get rid of these judges. It's an attempt to, to show everyone how much of a failure the Nephite uh, system of leadership is. Um, you know, they're, they're not just out to get rid of the judge so that they can, they can have their their criminal activities go unimpeded. They're, they want to show the rest of the Nephites that that system fails. Yeah, interesting. And, and fails spectacularly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think we have actually exceeded the time we allocated to ourselves. Uh, is there anything anybody else would like to add to this? Um, I suppose at this point I should have some big overarching uh, conclusion, but I really don't have one. Except that this has been, I think, a lot of fun, and I hope that we can repeat these uh, these roundtables on a regular basis, and uh, and that they'll be profitable to people who might tune in and have a look. Um, just seeing some some people who are uh, passionate about the scriptures and have read them carefully get together and discuss and share insights, and it'll be a different cast uh, from time to time. We'll try to get in as many different voices as we as we can, the faithful Latter-day Saint reading of the scriptures. Um, maybe I will close with one quick story that is not mine, but uh, uh, but Jim Faulkner's. Jim uh, tells a story, professor of philosophy at BYU, about being in grad school. Uh, and one of the professors in the philosophy department was also a rabbi. And Jim went to him at one point with a proposal that they have a one-on-one -on -one directed readings class where the rabbi would teach Jim sort of the rabbinic way of reading scripture. And uh, and the rabbi said, all right. The professor said, okay, that, that's fine. Let's do it. You choose what you want to read with me. Well, Jim said, well, you know, I'd like to do the whole Old Testament. But he, said he, he thought about it and thought about it and decided, well, better limit it to just a conservative thing, Genesis, the book of Genesis. Well, he came in and proposed it, and the rabbi said, are you kidding me? The whole book of Genesis? Come on. They ended up doing Genesis 1. They spent a whole semester on it. He said it was one of the best scripture reading experiences of his life, that they read it so carefully. And at every point, every clause, pausing to find out, what does this mean? You know, why is this here? What's the purpose of this? What function does it serve? So the fact is, we're only skimming the surface in discussions like this, and we know that much more can be said. But we're just hoping to start conversations. Uh, and these conversations will go on as they have been going on throughout the church, but that we can we can help a little bit in advancing the conversation, suggesting new new approaches and new ways of looking at the scriptures. So we'd like to thank uh, everybody who's who's been involved, all the participants in uh, in today's roundtable, and and uh, we hope there'll be many more to come. So thank you for everyone, to everyone. Say good night, Dan. I will say good night, Bill. <laughs>